Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Espace Multimedia Gantner for this online meeting uh, going to our exhibition, Agotelorism, Wrench Against the Machine, curated by Aude Launay. I am Valérie Perrin, and I'd like to tell you some few words about uh, the Art Center and Library Espace Multimedia Gantner. It's a place dedicated to the links between new um, technology, art society and is located in the east of France at Bourgogne, in Bourgogne and it's a part of uh, Conseil Départemental du Territoire de Belfort and it's a place free for everyone and it's um, our activities are exhibition, publishing, workshop, artist residency and we have also uh, a ex um, digital art collection. So because of the uh, Corona crisis, we do not have the opportunity to welcome the artists for setting this, uh, the artworks in this exhibition and meeting the audience to present the artworks. So in a way, this um, online meeting is an answer to this problem and I um, think a good way to document this uh, exhibition. So now let's start the meeting. Many thanks for joining us and many thanks for, to Joanna Moll and Zachary von Wall for accepting our invitation to discuss with Aude Launay. Now, let's, don, let's join Aude. Aude, it's up to you. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, hi, Joanna, Valérie, uh, Zachary. Uh, yes, so I, I'm really happy to talk with you today since, uh, as Valérie said, none of you had the ability to come visit the exhibition. Uh, that, like many more now, I guess, will mostly live as a, a vague idea and some JPEGs on the net. So for those who don't know what it's about, uh, the exhibition that gathers us today is the second part of my project around the idea of algotellerism, a term that I coined um, around from algo algo algorithms and tellerisms from Frederick Taylor and not terrorism, as it's sometimes understood due to my accent. So I guess it's sadly might be a research topic uh, sooner than later. <laughs> So this chapter is titled uh, Algo Terrorism, Rage Against the Machine, and the inspiration for it came from different sources, but mostly from the incredible rise of platform gigs a few years ago, as seemingly the new condition of work. Um, in the past, um, as I wrote in the, in the press statement to explain everything, in the past, the man has, has been first. In the future, the system must be first, uh, uh, wrote Frederick Taylor in the Principles of Scientific Management in 1911. Uh, and from his scientific management of work to the algorithmic management of workers in platform companies such as Amazon, Uber and Deliveroo, the evolution has been mainly technological, while on the ideological level, one notices rather a continuity. So what if our contemporary society was ultimately more hyper-industrial than post-industrial? After having explored two facets of work in the globalized digital age at the Mulus Kunsthalle for the first chapter, on the one hand, uh, a division of labor taken to extremes among click workers, and on the other, a persistent machinic illusion, because many tasks believed to be performed by computers are in fact performed by human beings. The algorithm, the Algotellerism exhibition continues to develop here at the Espace Multimedia Gantner in Bourgogne. So this chapter, Algotellerism Rage Against the Machine, examines how machines have been trained to recognize and define work and workers, how they've been fed with ideas and images, how they reflect this training in their actions, but also certain human beings, how certain human beings try to resubjugate their artificial eyes and neurons to put them um, in their place as mere extensions of humans. And uh, this appears in face-offs between natural and artificial intelligence. So um, the exhibition features works by Cathy Thornton from the Feminist Economics Department, uh, Zachary Formwalt, Sam Lavin, Silvio Lorusso, Lauren McCarthy, Joanna Moll, Julien Prévieux, and Sasha Sedlacek. And with us today, we have two of the artists, Zachary Formwalt and Joanna Moll. So they will um, present a little bit more about uh, their, um, their work in general and the piece they are presenting in the show and we're going to have a, a discussion together. 
So Zachary is from the US, uh, living in Europe, and he has, among other things, uh, exhibited at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Belgrade, at the Stedelijk Museum Bureau in Amsterdam, at Vox in Montreal, uh, at the Vexner Center for the Arts Columbus, and the Kunsthalle in Basel. Uh, he also writes, and his essays have been published in Grey Room, Open, Kunstlicht, and Metropolis M. And lastly, uh, in 2013, his film Unsupported Transit won an award at the Rotterdam International Film Festival. And uh, I think I can also say that he teaches at the Gerrit Rietveld Academy in Amsterdam. So, yeah, I mean, you know a lot of him, a lot about him right now. And then maybe, Zachary, you can tell us more about your work. Yeah, thanks for that uh, generous introduction. Um, does it? I feel like there's an echo, but no, it's not. Um, yeah, uh, I think I would. I always find it difficult to talk about my work in general. Um, so I think uh, what I will do is really talk specifically about this work that is in the exhibition, which is uh, a bit of an older work for me. It was made in 2009, and it really feels like a part of a, a very different moment. Uh, because it's it was very much attached to the whole um you know uh subprime mortgage crisis as it was called at the time the the big uh, like credit crunch and then resulting uh, up that, uh, from 2007 forward um and there were several works that well i felt like it was unavoidable to deal with that at, at the time um but i also felt like it, be interesting to sort of distance uh, the analysis from all the contemporary imagery that was going on. The thing was that I had for years been working on like a, an archive of images of economy is what I was calling it. And I was just collecting like images whenever uh, they appeared and uh, began with the, the um, uh, magazine, The Economist. Um, and then it kind of extended into other uh, other um, print media, mostly newspapers and stuff. I was living in Berlin at the time, and uh, and it was kind of rare to get a photograph attached to a financial story that didn't fit into like some really typical categories of like you know building facade, uh, you know people shaking hands, um, a coin, this kind of stuff. Uh, so I had these categories and I was collecting images uh, underneath them. And then the crisis hit and there was suddenly like this overwhelming amount of imagery uh, in relation to financial stories and it was all front page news and all this kind of stuff. So I, I decided that that archive was less interesting suddenly. It was also more difficult or I, it wasn't more difficult. It was too easy, you know, it was just like there were images all the time. Um, so I started kind of looking for other stuff and I made a film about stamps uh, from the 19 teens and 20s. Uh, and then after that, I made this film in place of capital, which is in the exhibition and in place of capital kind of. Um, it, it's well, this this point that you make about the, the, the recognition of I guess you could say that in place of capital, it comes out of this particular failure, which is very well known about early photography that, you know, it was so slow because of chemicals and optics, just practical technology meant that all exposures were these long exposures. Um, and that meant that that, of course, like cityscapes and landscapes and whatnot uh, seemed to be rather empty because anything moving through them wouldn't register on the, the photographic plate. Um, and and the seeing of this thing as a failure uh, is what you could say drove uh, certain developments within photography towards snapshot photography, um, toward having uh, you know chemical chemistry and optics that that would allow for uh, instantaneous exposures. Um, so so in place of capital, kind of. Uh, takes up this failure and in particular in relation to a, a photograph of Henry Talbot um, from 1845 in front of the Royal Exchange in uh, in London. 
and and kind of um, draws draws out the thing that was seen as a failure from Talbot's side. Yes, this is one of the there's a series of four images uh, that he made. Um, and and it looks at at this in relation to how Marx was describing um, capital at the time. Uh, well, yeah, there's two different moments of the Marx, but this this that moment in particular, which is from the, the second volume of Capital, um, where Marx describes capital in terms of this this kind of um, uh, you know um, that it is this this thing which well the final phase of of uh, the circulation of but in describing money capital actually is it possible to go back a little bit in that that uh, film that was up there yeah there great uh so precisely this this moment in uh in the circuit of uh money capital um, the final phase where you know money has uh, has first sort of um, bought labor and uh, and machinery uh, those have gone together and uh, then this the objects of the the products from that are sold on the market and uh, and money is kind of returned to itself but with a surplus um, and at this moment, only at this very moment when uh, money sort of uh, is gotten back from the sale of these products, um, there there is this kind of connection to how this increase actually happened, but that connection immediately disappears. Um, so so it has this this um, this kind of uh, amnesia, you could say, built into the 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 movement, uh, built into the circuit. Um, and so, so basically, this failure that that uh, was happening within photography to to be able to register the movement uh, or to be able to register moving bodies on a on a given photographic plate, um, what was seen as a failure from the standpoint of photographers such as Talbot writing explicitly about this failure um, in relation to images like these, uh, from Marx's perspective, you could say was actually. Uh, um, a sort of expression of the capital relation, and so these these photograph these early photographs, which which seem to have this technical flaw, actually were you could say at that moment um, had this ability to to uh, to kind of um, uh, if not illustrate at least to to sort of express uh, this commonality to to capital and their mutual failure to. Uh, to sort of um, capture uh, this this movement um, and and see it. Uh, so anyway, that that kind of stood at the at the heart of that film and was then used to uh, to look at what was happening within the financial crisis at that time and um, various imagery in relation to that. Uh, yeah. I think maybe I will stop it. I mean, I think in a way it's it's difficult for me to describe this this film in in this context. I would I think it would be nice to have um, uh, to maybe hear from Joanna and uh, and then also use it a bit um, responsibly because I feel like it also is it's maybe something. I mean, we have talked about this out that that it is a bit um, out of time somehow in relation to the because it's a very it's describing a, a, a very different moment um, than than the moment uh, that is taken up, perhaps uh, within your uh, theory of how the veil is. But maybe that's something interesting to talk about after. I don't want to. I feel like now I've gone on mm -hmm. a bit too long. Uh, yeah. So we can hear from Joanna Show and then. Uh, go on discussing that uh, right after. So Joanna uh, is uh, from Spain. Uh, she's an artist and a researcher and uh, her work um, has been exhibited notably at the Venice Biennial, uh, 
the Maxi in Rome, the CCCB, the ZKM in Karlsruhe, and the Hack in Basel, among many other places. And uh, it explores and critiques how techno capitalist narratives affect the literacy of machines, humans, and ecosystems. And Joanna also co founded the Critical Interface Politics Research Group and the Institute for the Advancement of Popular Automatisms. And I actually would love to hear about it a little bit too. And uh, she teaches at the University of Potsdam and the uh, Escola Elisava in Barcelona. So, Joanna, you can. Yeah, thanks, Ot. Uh, thanks, Valerie, as well. Thanks, Ak, for the presentation uh, talk. All right, it, uh, for me, likewise, Ak, um, it's very hard for me to speak about my work and to put it in context, right? Because uh, it's a bit hard to go out from yourself and understand where you are at um, or to understand your trajectory. So, I don't even know where to start. I mean, uh, generally, I, I I say to be my work at the intersection of intersection of art and uh, research. And more lately, I've introduced a little bit more investigative journalism uh, because I feel that a lot of things that I do have uh, have a lot uh, a big relationship to that, especially with um, one of my latest projects. Well, not so latest. I released it two years ago already. Uh, which actually that doesn't make it that old, but you know, <laughs> in the art space it seems like wow, you know, this is so old. Um, which is called the dating brokers, as I said, which I looked into all this ecosystem of um, online dating apps and uh, website that exploited data. Yeah, so I could just uh, this was like sort of thing was more investigative journalism one part than anything else, but I found out later. Yeah, when I talked to some journalists and they asked me how I did it and some of them even asked me like the techniques I use, which were super naive. <laughs> um, anyway, so my work really looks at all this ecosystem um, of data that builds our so-called data economy, right? And, and not just from the perspective of uh, data exploitation, but also from the perspective of infrastructures, uh, materialism at large, and especially um, environmental impact and the relationship of uh, data users, infrastructures and and nature. Uh, and I'm going more towards um, this field in other areas, not just data, but also like how we build electronics, uh, electronic devices, chain of global chain of production, uh, acceleration of production and its relationship to um, extractiv extractivist practices, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, the hidden life of an Amazon user, which is the work I present at the exhibition, it's a result of many years of uh, research, especially when it comes to uh, online tracking, which is this action of uh, tracking uh, user activity online. Uh, it's more like corporate surveillance, like uh, governmental surveillance. I use exactly the same techniques, but for other purposes. Um, but uh, uh, that's what I did for many years, reveal, uh, reveal technologies that allow corporate surveillance to exist and the environmental impact of, of such processes. So the hidden life, it's a very, actually like most of my projects, I think they're quite silly at the end, you know, they're very, very simple. Uh, it's not a big thing or a big display of, of, of things at the end, right? Um, so what I show there, uh, it's all the process that it took me to buy a book in Amazon, which was a book by Jeff Bezos called uh, Life and Lessons uh, for Success. Uh, and then it has like an incredibly long subtitle, but I never remember. It's like the life, the wisdom and the learnings. Basically like, yeah, the journey, the digital moments, rules for success, cultivated from the life and wisdom of Jeff Bezos. One of um, his better... Uh, I think the best advice that he gave was uh, sleep eight hours, which is like, wow. <laughs> anyway, um, so even though like I always say the same thing, so the joke starting to be very old, but even though like this very long title and subtitle, the book just had like 62 pages. It's like really, really thin. Yeah, and, uh, and the typography, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> is there someone there now? Or you already pre-recorded this? It's pre-recorded. Oh, wow. It matches. <laughs> 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 
anyway, so the, the font size is very big as well. Um, so what I did, I, I just tracked myself um, throughout all the interfaces that allow me to buy this book in Amazon. So I did the minimum amount of steps possible in the website to buy this book. So I had to go through 12 different interfaces. Yeah. And at the same time, I looked at all the code that made all these interfaces uh, exist and operate and also track user data at large. So it was more than 80 megabytes of information, which translated, as you can see it here, in a lot of code, almost 10,000 pages of printed code. It's a massive tower. It's just massive. And, and as you can see here in the exhibition, you could just paper a whole wall and, and you still had like some leftovers, right? So we don't tend to understand that all these processes are so um, energy intensive yeah? and all the materiality that allows all these companies to fulfill their business models, which basically are based on extracting every single thing that they can from the user. Yeah? So this project really talks about this double exploitation of the user, which is user is just not forced to um, it's just not being exploited by means of free labor in the sense that all your online activity or like user data is being commodified, quantified and commodified by these companies in order to ultimately uh, have some um, economic um, revenue, increase economic revenue. But the user is also forced to assume part of the energy consumption and therefore environmental impact of such processes because all this code, these 80 megabytes of code, were downloaded in my computer. Yeah, this was in an Amazon servers. They came from the, some Amazon servers into my computer. Yeah, and the work of, part of the work of uh, surveilling, tracking, extracting data happened using the energy from my computer. And we don't tend to see um, surveillance practices from this point of view, right? So really this project, that's what it aims at to a highlight like this double exploitation of the user. Uh, if, you scroll, if you scroll down the whole project, you can find it online in my website, it's available there. It's about 14 minutes of scroll, which is a lot, yeah? Um, so anyway, like I, I believe that highlighting this accumulation of materials would allow the user to understand or that those uh, processes are energy intensive and they are executed by us and we are forced to execute this. Yeah, there is no negotiation with, uh, with Amazon or any other platform whatsoever. So I think I leave it at that because I think I also spoke a lot. Um, we can discuss or anything you have in mind. Yes, uh, thank you, Joanna. In the exhibition, we actually uh, chose to print the code. So it's, it amounts to around like 10,000 something uh, A4 pages that are pinned on the wall, as you might have seen, and also uh, stocked on, uh, on the floor in little piles. So yeah, I think it's 10,485 A4 pages. It uh, always changes, depends on the exhibition. Yeah. I mean, some uh, some museum just called me the other day if I wanted the sheets back. <laughs> <laughs> was funny. No, no, I mean, I don't need them, of course. <laughs> but I mean, I, I hope it's very impressive for, for, the, for the, the visitors anyway, because I think it's really, that's, that's why I chose it, because I mean, uh, it's also about, of course, disclosing uh, everything that people is not, people are not aware of. And of course, this was really stunning as, uh, as an installation. Uh, I was also find it, I find it very funny that we are uh, actually discussing today uh, because of uh, everything that happens uh, in the news and uh, especially with the, the fact that uh, we also learned like a very few days ago that uh, Jeff Bezos is retiring, yep. which is also makes it well, very ironically retiring. to yeah. me, yeah, to have him. Uh, I mean, basically his picture is the, the first thing uh, you see when you enter the exhibition. So it's <laughs> it's kind of the, the granddad of, of, of this show. So it <laughs> makes it quite funny. But uh, another... Another fact I think uh, uh, is interesting is like, Zach, you pointed that the origin of, uh, in place of capital was the subprime crisis. 
And uh, so by my side, I chose it to... Um, I chose to make it the introduction of the exhibition for its historical take on the history of photography as a technology for the improvement, if I can say, of division of labor. It's just like it's it's um, like at the same at the exact same time, uh, which takes us back back to uh, 2008. Uh, Bitcoin was created, and uh, I don't know because uh, the exhibition unfolds with uh, a few takes on uh, cryptocurrencies, with uh, notably um, Sasho Sedlacek's project, which um, allows visitors to mine. Uh, his own cryptocurrency uh, while doing nothing, while standing still with a uh, mechanism of uh, pose recognition. And I, I wanted to know also if uh, it's something that uh, that sparked some interest, of course, uh, from both of you and uh, also in the light of uh, today's news that uh, Tesla, that is to say uh, Elon Musk's company, bought uh, 1.5 billion of Bitcoin just like, you know, also as this kind of counterculture currency that was created at this exact moment and that is now, you know, being invested in by all the biggest companies in the world. I, I just thought that it's, there's a lot of irony in all this, of course, in the idea that uh, in 2008, uh, there's been this, the, in the explosion of the crisis uh, and it's, also in this light that Bitcoin was created, of course, to to try to counter uh, the crisis in, in a way, if I can summarize that uh, this way. And uh, so as we were talking about this 2008 year with Zachary, I was I was uh, finding it very uh, ironical that I just got that in the news today that so Tesla, which is one of the biggest company right now but invested in bitcoin which was this alternative currency at the start and we are seeing more and more big companies today investing in it yeah yeah i i personally haven't really i mean i, I the the whole cryptocurrency thing i think is it's it's kind of funny because it does, it does sort of go through these waves now again it's like at such a huge value and people you know uh yeah it's like this hot spot for investment and stuff but personally i haven't i haven't really taken it up in any work uh, that i've that, that i've ever done but uh i mean for me the the subprime crisis was um i think and there were several works that i that i did afterwards that address this more explicitly but it, it really there was this kind of um what was interesting for me was the way that it was discussed in the media as actually um, in relation to the media into in relation to how the circulation of images actually affected the crisis. So it was um, and this was something which I found out was not very unique about it, actually, but that whenever there are these financial crises, um, this is precisely when a discussion emerges in the media about representation. And um, you know how how circulating an image uh, or or whether circulating an image will actually you know um, uh, cause uh, effects within the financial sphere or you know whether showing you know the the explicit thing that happened in the uh, in two thousand seven was this you know you had these bank queues that formed uh, in front of particularly Northern Rock uh, Bank in um, in England. Uh, and they had this whole government committee that investigated then afterwards what the decision making process was uh, in the newspapers behind uh, printing these images, because in printing the images, of course, more people saw these things and went and stood in the lines and, you know, the crisis was therefore worsened. So there was this discussion that, that came up about um, what the the kind of responsibility of the the press was in in reporting on events that happened and so it also kind of revealed that the financial sector is a sector which is um at least implicitly to be invisible and then it, when it becomes visible it's not functioning properly that it should be a thing and this very much relates i think to the amazon the, you know massive amount of data like if, if we were aware of that, if we had to page through 14 minutes of, you know, then we of course would never buy 
this book that is probably containing less text than the, the code that it takes to make that simple purchase. Um, but that this is like a constitutive uh, uh, characteristic of, of finance. Um, and that's also with that, that with Marx's formula for capital and, and this disappearance of the, the character of the, you know, the history of the production of the profit, basically, or of the surplus, that this is continually disappearing um, and that it has to. If it if it appears, then uh, then it's it, it, it won't happen, basically. So there is this kind of trade off that uh, that there. Yeah, I, well, maybe it goes too far with that, but I think I think the point is anyway. I'll, I'll stop there. I, I have a hard yeah, time thing as you can. <laughs> But anyway, that was, that was my interest in the, the so I know this is not answering your question about cryptocurrency, um, but uh, but for me that was the interest in that crisis, and I don't know the extent to was that really the case that the that was sort of seen as a response to the the crisis, the invention of Bitcoin. I mean, it, it's been said too. Yeah, I mean, it was conceived. Uh, I mean, I can't say of course uh, for sure. Uh, in response, but yeah, I mean, mostly because also, I mean, as you may know, like the um, the headline uh, of the of the time, the London time, I guess, yeah, from uh, uh, January, I'm forgetting the exact date, but January 2008 uh, is uh, locked in the code of uh, the first block of the Bitcoin blockchain, and this is a headline about uh, the the government of uh, England uh, bailing out banks. So I mean, it's. It refers directly to it, uh, and it was also, of course, anyway designed as a sort of yeah alternative currency, if we can put it gently like this. But so yeah, I mean, I, I just find it yeah, very very it's ironical. It is the currency that is supposed to track itself. I guess that's the other thing. So that would make it very different from this notion of, uh, or that would cause problems for the Marxist notion of the circuit of money capital, at least. Where you know you can you can of course track it in the books to a certain extent, but this disappearance is supposed to not happen in mm -hmm. Bitcoin. Like it's isn't that the, like it's the ledger is supposed to contain the whole history and yeah this kind of yeah yeah I actually even like in the in the first uh, chapter of the exhibition uh, chose to to present uh, what is called uh, a Marxist cryptocurrency uh, designed by um, um, telecommunistans, a uh, collective of artists from uh, mostly Berlin. And uh, yeah, we, we, we explored the, the sort of uh, contradictory uh, statement in this idea of, you know, of course, designing a, a Marxist uh, money, but uh, it's um, it's designed to also be uh, very ecological and run on um, old hardware. So it's, I mean, it's smart, Marxist, uh, eco-friendly. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Valérie, yes, I think you had questions too. I don't know if you want because the IC time is uh, running. Yes, thank you. <laughs> So I think uh, just one question because effectively uh, time is running. Um, it's for Joanna because uh, the visitor when they visit the exhibition always ask us how did you manage to get all the code? Well, that's uh, yeah, a lot of people ask me this, but it's so easy. You just you can do it through your browser. It's not rocket science. You just go to, uh, okay, so if you're using Firefox, you just go to the inspect panel, network, and then you go check all the requests that are being done and you go for one by one and you'll find the code. It's not, it's not rocket science. The yeah. difficult thing is to read the code. And even if you're an engineer, you won't understand anything. I mean, you will understand, you will get a hint of, okay, these things happen here, these things happen there, but you don't really understand all the things that they're going to extract or how things are working. So, yeah. And I also wanted to say something I forgot to say before. Um, like the installation display was not my idea, it was Oat's proposal and um, it was great. So okay. yeah, yeah, I mean, it was, it worked really great because I remember you proposed it because I remember you said that I was in, in front of Sam and, and you proposed this, so I was, um, I'm very, very happy. But generally I do it, uh, I do it differently, so that's great. So it's very easy, I, indeed, it's really easy.
Okay, many thanks. But again, it's what Zach said that uh, yeah, I mean, it's a brilliant sentence, right? For the everything has to be hidden for the system to run smooth. So again, if we would really need to uh, intervene all the code or load everything, or like. Some of these processes would be less automated, um, then things couldn't couldn't go. And I think that in that sense, like uh, metaphors have a huge role here in how system is being explained to us. As for example, the metaphor of the cloud, right? It's so super easy. <laughs> it's almost celestial mm. and stuff, and and that's the idea of of the internet, right? And 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 many others. Even the idea of the click, which is the and it's just like a sound, right? And we attribute it to an action, um, which indeed, if we would explain what a click actually is, what it actually is, would not click at all, probably. Same thing goes with the scroll and, and many other things. Yeah. So, which it's not the things that, there's all this jargon that doesn't describe at all what things are, <laughs> but it gives us an idea a very, very clear picture of what things are, <laughs> but they are not. And we just make this connection, right? Uh, which I think it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's also very much with any kind of uh, like imagery that we like, you know, photography today, there's no reason to to do it the way we do it with the technology that we have, but it's all like kind of made to emulate this model that was produced in the 19th century and uh, and is seen as the model of uh, reality, that 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 correspond, that, that particular image of reality is is closer than any other than, you know, that we can, that we sort of, yeah. Yeah, but why would you think it is so, actually? Like, it's a really good question, I think. Like, what would you think, uh, I mean, why do you, what do you think that the, um, the mechanisms are hidden also uh, in, the, in the photographical process right now? Yeah. Why? Yeah, yeah why do you think it is? Like, do you have a, any, like, opinion on that? Like, why would they hide it from, from the people? Like, is it... Well, what is to hide in that? Mm, well, yeah. yeah, but it's necessary in every... I mean, we live in some sort of turbo capital era, right? Where speed also maximizes profit and uh, knowing how things work and showing how uh, structures work, how systems work is uh, displaying complexities and complexities means uh, stopping, things, uh, stopping things. I mean, makes things slower. Yeah, yeah? And, and capital cannot afford that especially when it's based on a premise that uh, throwing it also increasing speed. I mean, it goes together with time. Um, yeah. I mean, that would be one possible answer. Yeah, I think, I think that makes a lot of, I mean, it is, I think it's very much linked to this thing that things have to be, they have to keep moving hmm. at all costs. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, would we be afraid actually to see how it works? Like, I think for my part, I, I, I have to say I was really shocked when I when I learned how digital photography was working. Like that, not, of course, that not any image was properly recorded as an image or as what you know your eye uh, thinks or makes you think it captures. And I mean, I still see that many people don't even also consider this, and so. What you, would it take? Are, do you, are you talking about like this computational photography? So, yeah, 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 yeah. Because that's sort of another. I mean, that's that's all. That's like a development within this. I think that uh, that is indeed kind of um, yeah. That of course, like camera phones are made to sort of produce the images that they have already produced somehow. Mm -hmm. You know, they they like. They're really good at portraits of certain, you know, uh, that play up certain features and all these things that we think that it doesn't do, that it is like an unfiltered image, but uh, the filtration is happening to a greater, or it isn't filtration, 
it's yeah, it's indeed like um, it's integrated very much in uh, within the technology more than we think. We think it's still an optical technology, but it's um, becoming increasingly less so. I mean, it still uses a lens, but uh, but it actually we don't need. There are there are cameras now that don't use lenses, and that's kind of a strange. Mm -hmm strange thing to understand for I think people like like of our generation or you know whatever like you know people who grew up with when photography was that who actually like you know like I studied photography in school for me like a photograph it's it's very it always relates to that and yeah uh, if it looks like that then I assume it was made optically even if there is some and anything that's the basis and this other, but it's not necessarily the basis anymore. There is like through and through computational photography, but I don't know that much about that stuff, the computational photography, mm. but it's interesting. It's weird. I have no clue whatsoever, so <laughs> I can't comment on that. No, I was just wondering if uh, if you would think that it would scare people away or something like uh, give us a similar you know feeling to people that finally would understand that machines are way more independent than we think. But are they really? Uh, I mean, I don't know, in, in these processes of digital photography, I tend to think so. But... Yeah, but the end infrastructure that allows these images to exist is very much guided by, uh, I wouldn't say, yeah, I mean, human labor as in the classic sense of labor, but, uh, but it is. Uh, mm. And ultimately, nature is what allows all these things to exist, right? So, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, and I also think, though, like that it's there are these historical models that are built into something like computational photography and the, the kind of, um, uh, in a way, it's maybe less even autonomy of the machine because these these um, kinds of images that we uh, see as photographic images, these machines are built to make images that resemble those. And that comes from a particular historical moment. And those machines mm -hmm. are harnessed to, to reproduce that image over and over again. So they're kind of stuck to something that has, is very much a, a human creation, a social creation, these, the, the images that we've seen historically. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it has the potential for being very autonomous. And, but I think the scariness, in a way, is not so much the autonomy in that sense. Just got some message there. Uh, but yeah, it, it is more that um, it's more like in this kind of that this that we are stuck with this old model that is that that kind of uh, I don't know it it's it I think that there there is it's not so much that the 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 autonomy of the the machine I think as it is the reinforcing that the machine does at scale that it picks up things that exist and it reproduces like existing relations in a way that that we don't have the power to do unassisted and the reproduction of those existing problems is what i think is scary yeah yeah i mean i agree and i think it also has to do about with the imaginaries that these uh, machines produce which is very when they are let's say in charge of uh, social reproduction uh, they produce certain imaginaries which i think they're very hard to break in many ways so i think that's probably the danger as well i think yeah yeah which was one of the ideas actually driving uh, this room where i put uh, your works facing each other so. <laughs> but i don't know maybe uh, joanna it's time for you or yeah you should leave yeah. soon okay so i guess well thank you uh, of course, for uh, coming today, try to have this kind of human connection. <laughs> <laughs>
machine mediated human connection to talk about this exhibition that explores yeah I, I, what i said earlier but yeah uh i guess valerie maybe you 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 want to conclude uh or just yes just yeah. to thank you a lot uh, for participating for it's our first uh, meeting online so uh, many thanks uh, joanna and zachary and of course uh, our curator odone for this very interesting meeting and uh, everything will be put on uh, our website channel and uh, our website so you can find also of our disc of our vis visit uh, online of uh, the exhibition on our channel website and website so many thanks hope Thank uh, you. you enjoy it and uh, hope to find to see you in uh, blood and flesh one time <laughs> i hope so i would really love to see the exhibition really much yeah. but uh, Great exhibition. Uh, it's <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's going to be a phantom of an exhibition, and yeah. Oh God. Well, maybe I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what will happen because I don't think this will stop anytime short, um, anytime soon. But we'll see. Mm. Anyway, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, a nice meeting all of you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. bye, -bye.